Hi, I'm Dr. David Forstein, a reproductive endocrinologist at the Greenville Health System and the University of South Carolina School of Medicine, Greenville. We're going to be speaking today about hysterosalpingogram, otherwise known as an HSG. Hysterosalpingogram is one of those common compound words that we use in medicine. Hystero comes from the Greek word uterus, and salpingo comes from the Greek word for tube. So we're looking at the uterus and tube. Our learning objectives are to define the indications and contraindications for HSG and to understand the basic technique of the procedure. We will also look at the basic anatomy as seen on x-ray or fluoroscopy during an HSG and identify some common normal and abnormal findings of the procedure. This is a picture of a normal HSG and it gives us the opportunity to review the pelvic anatomy as seen on, on imaging. Remember that an HSG is a minimally invasive diagnostic procedure in which we inject radio-opaque dye into the uterus very gently and then take pictures in real time with fluoroscopy or statically on x-ray to diagnose abnormalities of the female upper genital tract. The first thing we see is the catheter in the lower uterine segment. Next we see the uterus. This is a uterus that has normal shape and contour. Finally, we're going to look at the fallopian tube. Fallopian tubes have three parts. You can see the skinny isthmic portion. That's the part that's closest to the uterus. The fallopian tube then gets a little bit wider in diameter. That's the ampulla. And the very end of the fallopian tube is the fimbria, which is a little bit difficult to see on these films. Indications for this procedure include infertility, recurrent pregnancy loss, and suspected congenital uterine anomalies. Sometimes we will also do HSGs, localization of fibroids, suspected intrauterine adhesions, and preoperative evaluation for tubal reanastomosis. The most important contraindications are a history of an active or recent pelvic infection, active vaginal bleeding, or a current pregnancy. It's also very important to know whether the patient has any allergies to contrast dye. After confirming that the patient is not pregnant nor bleeding, and after obtaining informed consent, the patient is placed into the lithotomy position and a speculum is placed into the vagina. On the left, you can see a picture of the woman's cervix. The cervix would then be swabbed with betadine and a catheter or cannula would be gently placed into the cervix or into the uterus. Here you can see a catheter and here you can see a cannula that we use during the procedure. The other instruments there include a single tooth tenaculum, which can be used to grasp the cervix to help with positioning. Once the catheter or cannula is in place, warmed radiopaque dye is gently inject into, injected into the uterus under fluoroscopic guidance. In a normal case, dye is observed entering the uterine cavity and its shape and contour is noted. Dye is then observed entering the fallopian tubes and hopefully exiting the fimbriated end of the tubes. This is another image of a normal hysterosalpingogram. First, take note of the single tooth tenaculum and cannula in the lower uterine segment. Next, we can see the uterus and the isthmic portion of the fallopian tubes. You can see where the tubes are getting a little wider. That's the ampulla. And finally, particularly on the right side, you can see this crescent-shaped areas of dye. This is the dye freely spilling from the fallopian tube and wrapping itself around the bowel, giving us that classic crescent shape. Here is another normal HSG. You can see the dye has spilled from both fallopian tubes. There are two findings on the HSG in this case that are interesting to look at. The first is the top of the uterus. It has a slightly different shape than what we've seen before, but this would be considered a normal variant. Second, we see an area in the isthmic portion that looks a little stippled. That is a sign of a condition called salpingitis isthmica nodosum. Salpingitis isthmica nodosum, or SIN, has been associated with infertility and subfertility. Here's an image of an HSG with a lot going on. The first we see is that the uterus is deviated towards the patient's right side or to your, towards your left. We also don't see any dye getting into the fallopian tubes. But most importantly, we see an area of the uterus in which no dye is seen. 
This represents an intrauterine fibroid. Here we see an abnormal HSG. We're just going to focus on the uterus, and you can see it almost looks like bunny ears. This represents a, a congenital uterine anomaly, and it could either be a septum or a bicornuate uterus. It's important to remember that you can't tell the distinction between those two on an HSG, but we do know that septums are 10 times more common than bicornuate uterus. This woman has a double uterus, or a uterus didelphus. That's a complete duplication of the uterus and cervix. She has what looks like a two-chambered uterus, which is correct, but if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see that she has two separate cervixes as identified by these two lower uterine segments. This is an unusual congenital uterine anomaly. Here we see a patient who has bilateral proximal tubal occlusion as identified by the arrows. The uterus is normal in its shape and contour, but no dye is seen getting into the fallopian tubes. Our last image is of a woman who had pelvic inflammatory disease and now has bilateral hydrosalpinx, as seen by the very large dilation of the ampullary portions of the fallopian tube on each side. This is a common cause for tubal infertility. In summary, we've taken a few minutes to define the indications and contraindications for HSG and given you a basic understanding of the technique of the procedure. We've looked at some normal anatomy and looked at some common and uncommon abnormalities of the uterus and fallopian tubes. If you're a medical student, please look for the opportunity to participate in an HSG when you're on your OBGYN rotation. Thank you.